So not too long ago, the San Francisco Chronicle wrote that the Mechanics Institute stands as a beacon of what a cultural institution can be for its citizens. So when I wrote, opened the paper and I read that out loud, I thought, well, that's something to aspire to for sure. And, you know, as I think about the Mechanics Institute, I think about a place, and I look at all these books, I think about a place where the truth is pursued. I think about a place where beauty matters. I think about a place where people can escape. I think about a place where people belong. And I think about a place where the future is imagined. And finally, I think it's a place that makes San Francisco, well, San Francisco. So another place like that is City Lights Bookstore, which is a co-sponsor of this event tonight. So I love that Mechanics Institute and City Lights Bookstore come together. And I think, is Peter Maravellis in the room? There he is. So Peter, like his founder, like the founder of City Lights, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, they are treasures unto themselves. And we're just so grateful that you're here tonight. Thank you, Peter. So we've been doing our best here at Mechanics Institute. Membership's up. You're supporting us like never before, and we're grateful for that. Um, and I remember the last time Robert Rosie Rosenthal was here, tonight's interviewer, and he was here for a program discussing the attacks on the journalists at the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo in Paris. And that evening, he was one of the most articulate and thoughtful people I had heard talk about freedom of the press and how it contributes to our democracy. And I, I, I learned that, that that thinking is rooted in experience. He's a man who's worked at the New York Times. Uh, in fact, if you've seen the post, he might have been one of those uh, bright-eyed, uh, guys in the back room at the New York Times going through the Pentagon Papers, uh, uh, making the photocopies. Um, he was a foreign correspondent in Africa and war-torn countries, uh, for which he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He was the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, managing editor of our hometown paper, the San Francisco Chronicle. And... Since leaving the Chronicle, he's done an amazing job as a leading force behind the Center for Investigative Reporting based in Berkeley that's doing incredible, incredible work these days. Thank you for that. So it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Rosie, a good friend. And uh, Daniel, we are just thrilled to have you here at Mechanics Institute. Thank you for coming, and thank you for all you've done. Room, which reeks of wisdom and knowledge, and we're sitting with someone I think is one of the more remarkable human beings of the last part of the 20th century into the early part of the 21st century, whose life really, uh, for me, symbolizes integrity and courage and wisdom. And uh, we're going to talk tonight about his newest book, uh, you know, The Doomsday Machine, for general nuclear war carried out as planned, how many people will be killed in the Soviet Union and China? What was your reaction when you saw that? Graph. It was a, uh, a lot of people have the book here now. You may not have read it yet. But okay. I produced no, this, this graph. Wait. Turn on your, um, it's not on? Sorry. Click on your I thought I did. Go for it. OK. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. I was saying that um, <clears throat> I produced this graph. A lot of you have seen the book, or some will have it. From memory, it's very simple, obviously. Uh, hard to forget, and I put it in. It has the heading, Top Secret Sensitive, um, and for the president's eyes only. And I wasn't the president, but I had, I had written the question to which this was an answer. So the uh, president's, one of his, the deputy assistant for national security, Bob Comer, showed me 
the graph, which was their answer. And the question was, as he said, how many people would be killed in the USSR and China only? I won't um, say at this moment, it takes a little too long, I explain in the book why I limited it to that uh, at that point. They did have an answer, and uh, which I had thought they had not actually calculated. I was surprised that they came right back with that answer. But So I had to enlarge the question since they apparently did have a simple calculation of this. And I said, okay, how many would be killed altogether if your plans, the Joint Chiefs' plans, were carried out as planned? There's no divine wind that uh, disturbs it. They're, they don't preempt. It doesn't go badly some way. You hit the targets you mean to hit. I was to paraphrase here. How many people will die altogether? And the answer was... 600 million, which uh, 100 holocausts is the way I saw that. And that included 100 million of our allies in West Europe. We weren't targeting them in NATO, uh, although, strictly speaking, as the war went on, if it went on even hours, if there were Russian troops from East Germany, I've never mentioned this before, but if they'd come into West Germany in the course of this process, yes, we would have targeted them. We were targeting East Germany, uh, near, uh, around Berlin. Berlin would have gone from this. But in any case, radioactive fallout from our own strikes in East Europe would have annihilated up to 100 million people in West Europe, depending which way the wind blew as they testified in Congress later. But whichever way the wind blew, another 100 million would be killed in East Europe, and a lot of people here will remember that those were the captive nations then. And they were captive. They were, uh, as a result of World War II, uh, Soviet Union had occupied them and essentially installed regimes of their own liking. That was early regime change, in effect. Uh, in other words, it was part of a Soviet empire in that, and we called them the captive nations, but we were going to annihilate over a hundred million of them in our strike. Actually, not too many from bases, but from air defenses, so that our planes could come into Russia. They had a lot of air defenses in Poland and Hungary and Romania. So I'm going to interrupt you. So you, you knew all that. How did you feel? Well, I read that. How yeah. did you feel when you saw that? Well... You know, that was, you know, you're a real journalist. I'm sitting next to you. It's funny, you know. It's a, that's the question when a catastrophe has just happened, you know, and the, the house is burning and, and every, everybody is fleeing. And how do you feel about this? You know? um, how did I feel when I discovered that the people I had beer with in the evening, the colonels who I was working with on the air staff and the joint staff, were producing these plans during the day and apparently knew it? Uh, and their, their chiefs knew it. And these were Americans. And I was uh, stunned. I thought, this piece of paper, initially, the 300 million, should not exist. Nothing, it should refer to nothing that does exist. And I knew that it referred not to hypothetical calculations, uh, even before computers on the whole, but that wasn't uh, slide rule stuff. This was the estimate of what they would do with bombs that were waiting all over the world, thousands of them, a number, an increasing number in submarines, an increasing number in holes in the ground in missiles, but air bases all over the world and aircraft carriers that were planned as simultaneously as possible, which is a relative matter, to truck over thermonuclear weapons to the Sino-Soviet bloc. No matter how the war had started, over Berlin, over Yugoslavia, perhaps over Iran, uh, an uprising in East Europe, China was to be annihilated. And this was 1961. Now, actually, the Sino-Soviet bloc had begun breaking up in 59 and 60 and 61. That's another story. But, and uh, many people knew that, but many people did not know that in the government. And the plans, anyway, were don't leave that other commie country alive to pick up the marbles, as kind of the way they used to talk, basically, to, to uh, be the survivor of a war in which we've destroyed the Soviet Union, and they may have destroyed us. So China has to go, too. 
Uh, so, as I say, 600 million. I, I thought this was the most evil plan that had ever existed in the history of our species. And insane. Simply an insane plan. Done by people who I knew were like you and me, frankly. Like, they were not monsters. I just met one man tonight who, when I was writing the plans for this thing, the, the draft, I just signed a book for him, he was outside the White House protesting testing, uh, nuclear testing. Well, as I said to him, uh, you were on the right side then. Uh, I actually was not in favor of testing, I must say, at that point. I was working inside to deter a Soviet attack. Nevertheless, I was in the Pentagon, and as I said, if I'd been out with you, I would have less to confess in the subtitle of this book, Confessions of a Nuclear War. So it's 1960. You stayed within the Pentagon. <clears throat> and one of the things you knew at the point when you saw that, because you'd done, your, you'd been th done the field work, was how screwed up the whole concept of one guy has a button in control, the whole question of delegation. Well, Can you <coughs> talk a little bit about what you learned doing that? And is it relevant today? OK. Can I separate two issues? And I'll, I'll come back to one of them. The issue we've just been talking about is not genocide. Uh, there's no 600 million race by any standard of race, anybody there. It's not just multi-genocide. You know, it's super. Uh, the USSR itself had, you know, uh, dozens and scores of ethnic groups, all of which would be annihilated by this. So this, we're talking about a plan here for genocide uh, there's no way not, you know, talking about screwing that up is, you know, doesn't, that should not exist as a plan. However, in terms of the idea of having some weapons not to give the Soviets a monopoly, such as we'd had at the beginning, seemed to me to make sense then as a deterrent. And the question, supposing it had not been thousands of weapons and hundreds of millions of people, but let's say World War II levels of damage. Herb York once said, what's the most amount of killing that one man should be able to do in a day or a week or a month? He said, well, supposing it were World War II, 60 million altogether. That's as much as one person. You know, it's, a, it's above. That's it's that's an upper limit to what one person should be able to uh, control. Okay. There are nine nuclear states now. He said, to kill 600, uh, 60 million people with thermonuclear weapons takes 100 kiloton weapons, no more than 100. Conceivably, you could run it up to 200 if they didn't all get there and so forth. But really, not more than much, uh, 100, closer to 100. He said that in 1982. In 1967, under Lil B. J., we had 37,000 nuclear weapons. Not 100, not 200, not 1,000. 37,000 weapons, mostly thermonuclear. The Russians got about uh, 35,000 or so about that time. The, the top level for the world, between the two of us, when there were only two, was 67,000 nuclear weapons. And as I say, 100 of which would cause the casualties of World War II in uh, a day or a week. So I'm saying we're now talking about something that just transcends human language. You can't say screwed up. You, even evil doesn't seem right. It's just outside language somehow. But by the way, this, uh, I have to say this, the 600 million was wrong. First of all, it turned out much later, I didn't know it at the time, but a whole book has been written on this, they weren't including the damage from fire. Fire, too hard to calculate. Depends on the wind, depends on the structures, depends on the flammable material and so forth. So they didn't calculate that. Only blast, immediate prompt radiation and fallout. But fire is the main effect of thermonuclear weapons. So we're really talking about a billion right there. That's before there's any Soviet retaliation say a billion and a half altogether, there were three billion people in the world then. So that's half the population of the world. It's not what John Somerville later called omnicide. Omnicide is what it turns out we would have done in fact. 
And I'll, I'll say this, and you know, let me, it would have to come out eventually, so let me say it now. It was not for another 20 years that uh, people like Carl Sagan and Brian Toon and uh, Alan Roebuck and others calculated what the effect would be of smoke lofted from the fires, from the fires, not from the blast. And the blast and the firestorms that would be created would loft this smoke by the hundreds of millions of tons of smoke and soot into the stratosphere, not into the lower atmosphere, in the stratosphere where it would not rain out. That has been true all along, but we didn't know it till 1983. And people managed to doubt it the way they, uh, an entire party in this country still doubts climate change, right? Well, what I'm about to say is no longer any more controversial than man-made climate change, and that is after the last 10 years. And that is, the smoke that didn't burn out, uh, didn't rain out, would go around the world, the globe, very quickly, within days, and reduce the sunlight reaching the Earth by about 70%, producing a winter effect all year, an ice age effect that would kill all the harvests and all the ve most of the vegetation, and starve nearly everyone. That was true in 1961, but it was even true 10 years earlier in 1950. So that's the reality of what we're talking about. You were saying about being screwed up, and I'll just say in one sentence, even if we'd had 10 weapons or 15 weapons, the fact remains that the, um, <laughs> well, as somebody said of Donald J. Trump, uh, his, his friend, Thomas uh, Bannock, isn't that right, said he's not only crazy, he's stupid. Uh, these plans were insane and crazy. They were also stupid and reckless because uh, they did involve, for example, uh, hitting Moscow in the very first wave. That's always been true uh, to this day, which means that there is no possibility of ending the war. Whatever weapons remain on either side or all sides are now without a central leader and they make their own decisions I'm gonna as to where they go. It's not a really good plan in my opinion, but I was never able to get so, the military to agree to that. So did that question of command and control, and what he's saying is that part of the strategy wasn't just to hit military facilities, but mm. if you take out the brain, who do you then negotiate with? Yeah, I'm saying so, that, that to me, what do you call that? I, I would call that stupid. But and yet the chance of doing well, that was, was just stupid. It was, but did, was that something that you were able to debate with yeah, the, well, Ma not debate, McNamara? Or or have you, I know in the book you, you, you think that McNamara, though he wouldn't acknowledge it, understood the no, stupidity No, McNamara did. So we actually, we actually uh, under McNamara, when I say on April 7th, my birthday, I did a draft of new guidance which allowed for withholding an attack on Moscow. Now remember, Moscow, at, don't remember, you don't know this, but <laughs> Moscow at that time was, would be the recipient of 158 nuclear weapons. Because every, un, every unit in the world that could on a one-way suicide mission get their fighter bomber into Moscow would do it. So everybody was piling on to Moscow, and essentially that's remained true still. Cheney is described in a recent book as having, Cheney, remember Dick Cheney, uh, Darth Vader here, and he was, a, he was appalled as Secretary of Defense to discover how many weapons were targeted on Moscow. Now that's almost 40 years after I supposedly put a withhold into this, uh, into this plan. So but they never took that seriously. Not hit Moscow? No, come on, give us a break. So it's, I'm going to set the time frame, so it's 61, 62, you were, you were in the room, you were in the Pentagon during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. But Five or six years later, you decided you had to get the Pentagon Papers out. What did, did you years, ever... Eight years later. Eight years later, 68, 69. Nine, 69. So what in your mind changed that you wanted to get the Pentagon Papers out? What, did you have a reaction like people have to know about this? Well, Do you, I know in the book you talk about a regret, but that, give us the time, thinking then. Did you ever think this information has to get out to the public then, or you just well, were so much part of the system you couldn't do that? Uh, Nobody had ever done such a thing, so it wasn't in my mind earlier. Um, Congress 
was, I don't blame myself entirely for not having put it out earlier because A, it was, it was literally kind of unthinkable and B, not entirely practical because it was a question of getting the nuclear material or later Vietnam to Congress. Congress was, read, uh, was run now by Southern Democrats, the racist wing of the, Demo of the New Deal. The basis for the New Deal was a, a bargain between, or you know, a, comp a coalition between Southern racist segregationists, that was the Democratic Party then when I was growing up, and Northern uh, unions and some corporations and this and that, civil rights people. But it wasn't until 1968 that George Wallace peeled off the South as an independent from the Democratic Party. Uh, after Lyndon Johnson, the hero of Vietnam, basically, but after uh, he did, in fact, uh, put through a Civil Rights Act and, uh, you know, in, two ways, in 64, 65, which lost the South for the Democrats forever, as, as he said. It's, he said for a generation or two. They've never come back. They went to Wallace, then in 72 they went to Nixon, and that's where they've been since. So a lot of you, again, are, are uh, almost old enough, uh, not as old as me, but uh, anybody here older than me, actually? I'm, I'm 86. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Come on. Don't, don't. Uh, what? Very good. Okay. <laughs> I, I got such a thrill tonight that Lawrence Fern Goody sent me a hug, and I sent him one back. He's 99. <laughs> so he's got 13 years on me. But um, those of you who, however, are, you know, in the, in the general range, will remember the solid South. And that meant the solid Democratic South. And that meant the Jim Crow segregated South, which was Democratic, uh, run by the Democrats. And now it's Republican. And although it's not legally segregated anymore, we've discovered now that we have an Attorney General who, now I'm not, I'm not gonna joke about this, I believe, well, let me just say, uh, this is not what I believe. I would be very confident that our Attorney General Jeffrey Sessions would like legalized segregation back. Jim Crow back. Apartheid back. That's our Attorney General. And uh, I was going to say a little more speculatively, I think I've learned more about this country's past in terms of the Civil War since Charlottesville, at the age of 86, than I ever knew in my life before. And I don't think I'd ever faced up to what I now believe in the last few months. Uh, it's now kind of a new fact for me. The South never gave up on slavery, never accepted that slavery was wrong or had been wrong. They were simply defeated and they were occupied. And then when the troops were, came out as, a, as a, an election deal in 1876, Jim Crow was put in as a substitute. And that's what we're seeing the resurgence of right now. And that is part of our country, not just our history, but our present. Are you running for office? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd rather okay. go to prison. As so I said, uh, yeah, you yeah. could, but uh, and Dan, he's been arrested 86 times for civil disobedience so, uh, and protesting nuclear. But I want to get back to the question you wavered on me. And did you ever consider in that period oh, going I, well, public? I, I did start to say that to give the papers to Congress then meant giving them to, to Richard the, Russell and Senator Thurmond and uh, others like that who, uh, it, they weren't only segregationists. They were also super hawks, super anti-communists. I was anti-communist, but I was anti-communist. And unlike perhaps some people here, I'm, I haven't recanted on that. I think it was not, I'm talking not about communism in this country, which was never a threat at all. Stalin. But in terms of Stalin's Russia, uh, it was as bad as I thought it was. What it wasn't was Hitler's expansionist, aggressive, uh, attempting to take over the world by military means yeah. and those nuclear means and, and that I thought during the Cold War. And the, that was a delusion. And the book has a fascinating anecdote about Hitler when you're talking about the bombing of cities. Uh, and, but I, we're going to have questions in a few minutes so you can start thinking about it. But I want to bring it to today. If, if what, how relevant, you know, everyone hears about the football. The football. How, tell us yeah. about the football. Because I think you know, you're talking about history, but a lot of what Dan... Yeah. 
is talking about is completely relevant today. We know about the football, the guy who's near the president who has a nuclear coat. How important is that, or the, is it the supposed a bunch? The so-called football is a briefcase, which you can see on uh, Google, by the way. If you put in football or president's briefcase or something, you will see the president's aide carrying this uh, leather briefcase, uh, about this high, fairly heavy thing, which has a computer in it. It has various. It has diagrams showing the different options that he could use in nuclear war, and would have four minutes to decide on if there was, if the Hawaii alert had gone to the White House and was for real, as has happened uh, more than once. In other words, the Hawaiian alert went to people in their car, you know, in their cell phones and whatnot. But false alarms <coughs> have actually reached the Joint Chiefs, uh, the NORAD, the Air Defense Command, and so forth, and even the President's assistant in the past. And fortunately, were discovered to be false alarms a minute or two before life was ended. And again, not to exaggerate, we're not talking about life ending, actually. I want to be very precise here. I've recently learned, uh, didn't know it earlier, that most biomass of living material on this earth is microbial, is microscopic. Uh, viruses, including viruses, bacteria, and others. So more than half, will, most of that will remain. But we're talking about the total extinction of most animals larger than a squirrel or a raccoon. Not all humans, because we're so clever and adaptable, and we wear clothes, and we make fires in houses, and we uh, travel long distances, unlike other animals. We can probably survive 1% or so of the nuclear winter in Australia or New Zealand, uh, Ellen Roebuck tells me, eating fish, and uh, that's not a small number of people. 1% is 70 million, if it was that many. It might not be that many. And the ozone might finish them off. But 99% goes. The cities go. Civilization goes. And that is what is at stake. If a false alarm occurred uh, involving Russia, as has often, a number of times happened, several times very seriously, four or five times very seriously, hundreds of times less seriously. In fact, uh, a study in Congress in, uh, after there had been four serious false alarms in 79 and 80 uh, by Goldwater and, and uh, Hart together, a Republican and a Democrat. They looked into this and they found that in the previous couple of years there had been 1,500 fairly serious, slightly serious false alarms, but only these four, five, or six that were quite serious. If that happened during a crisis, and some of them have, like a war with uh, Korea, with North Korea, if we got an indication falsely that the Russians were taking the side of the North Koreans, were getting into this, and it was coming, it would go up to Trump, and if that lasted four, five, six, seven minutes into that, uh, it would end. This would all end. That's the sword of Damocles that JFK referred to before the UN in 1961. He said humanity exists on this sword. Remember a uh, king, somebody was, uh, was jealous of the king's prerogatives and, and the king said, here, you sit in my throne. And he had to sit there and he had suspended over the throne for this, purpose, this person's benefit a sword suspended by a horsehair. He said, that's what it means to be a king, you know, to have this over you. Well, JFK said, this hangs over humanity, and we've got to change this. And that's when I was working for him. But JFK more than doubled the weight of that sword. And Reagan doubled it again. And uh, Obama is increasing it, or reproducing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Trump is increasing it. And I was just thinking of this metaphor today, it so happens, but uh, Kennedy did talk about strengthening that horse here. You know, let's put a withhold in. I put in a withhold about hitting China. You could make a decision. It wouldn't be automatic. I put in a withhold, and this was a big one, about hitting cities. None that. of that had any effect. It turned out later that the plans, that was just ignored. The plans were always for hitting cities, and something I learned in the course of reading this book, writing this book, 
I had to, uh, I, uh, somebody sent me a document that I'd never seen. It had been declassified uh, just a few years earlier, and I hadn't seen it in the National Security Archive. And it was a document from 1968. Now remember, I was writing these plans in 61. In uh, 68, where was I? Oh, I don't know, in 69 I was copying the Pentagon Papers. You in, in, Vietnam. Six, in 68, no, I you came back, back in 67. Okay. okay, so I was reading the Pentagon Papers in 68, actually. Okay, back at Rand. So this document comes out um, of a meeting with the Joint Chiefs and the President and Walt Rostow from the Policy Planning so forth and so forth. And he was saying, and Clifford, the new Secretary of oh, Defense yeah. in March, top secret. And it says, we really should change the automatic plan for delegated authority so that there will be two possibilities, not just hitting China and Russia. I read this document, I thought, I thought I changed that in seven years earlier. And says, no, there really should be, it's in the book here, I had to put it in the notes at the very end after the manuscript had gone in. And I said, I learned now, I thought that was the one thing I'd done uh, that might stick, that China would not automatically be hit uh, in the event of a war with Russia. And uh, no, in 68 they're saying, that would be a good idea. Let's separate it so that China is not automatically hit. And they all agree, yeah, let's do that, so whether they did or not. I'm going to ask one know. more question, and then we'll throw it out to the audience. Is that about right? Um, so in, in the, uh, at the end of the book, you talk about some regrets. About, but why did you write this book now? Because here's a little backstory. He, some of this book was written many, many years ago, but his publisher said no one would be interested. And now it's 30 years later, and... 40. It's more, 40 years, and it's more relevant than ever. Uh, so why did you, why, at this point in your life, why did you feel you had to finish this book and get it done? I mean, did you hope, well, well, I mean, it's why? been a difficult conversation hearing all this, but what's, is there a solution? Is there hope around this? Well, what, what do people have I, to do? I had, uh, you know, a, a, um, a reaction similar to that of Ed Snowden, who was actually a libertarian Republican before as a young man, he he's still, still a young man. He's still young, and he's <laughs> still actually, I think in one respect, he's a gun nut, uh, actually. He likes, he likes guns. But uh, as a libertarian, you know, against gun control laws and so on. But nevertheless, though Republican, he had hopes that Barack Obama would change the surveillance system, the unconstitutional, illegal surveillance that had been going on, as he knew at the National Security Agency, under George W. Bush. And he knew this, everybody in NSA knew this was illegal, it was unconstitutional, but they had kids in college, as they told him they had mortgages, they had things, they couldn't do anything about it. And he uh, was living in Hawaii uh, with a partner who's now with him in, uh, in Moscow. But he had hopes that Barack Obama would, might carry out the plan he made at Prague in his first year for which he got the Nobel Prize later that year, which was to move toward the, uh, well, that was toward the abolition of nuclear war. I'm sorry. His hope was somewhat, that was my hope. His hope was that Obama would change this surveillance system. And he quickly realized that's not going to happen. So this, inf this is Obama or Chelsea Manning three years earlier. This information should be out. Somebody should put it out. Nobody else is going to do it, so I'll do it. And that last, that last point, which seems kind of obvious to the person, I can say, I identify with these two people more than anyone else on earth. Because we, we went through that little syllogism there, or whatever you want to call it, and we reached that point. It seemed very, okay, nobody else is going to do it. Uh, I should do it. And uh, it turns out that that's uh, very unusual, actually. So I uh, uh, identify very much with Chelsea Manning, uh, but somebody asked me today, what do you think about her running for the Senate in Maryland? I said, she's a friend and a hero of mine, and I wouldn't wish that on a friend or a hero. Uh, and although I identify with Chelsea, I realize she's a very different person from me. I would not run for the Senate uh, in Maryland. But I did finally say, okay, Barack Obama's not gonna change the nuclear he said he would, 
like JFK. You know two other people who said that? Jimmy Carter at the beginning of his Senate, a world free of nuclear weapons. Ronald Reagan, a world free of nuclear weapons. Each of them enormously expanded, as did Obama. And it's just so the institutional corporate pressures and the political pressures, I think these actually, these four presidents who were sincere about that to a considerable extent, but they had other priorities and that proved impossible for them. And uh, so the president isn't going to do it. So, so who can, we have to do it. Thank okay, you. that's, you got there. Uh, one last thing, because it's so remarkable. Uh, can you, I know that you did this on your inspection tour around the world. Tell us what it was like to touch a nuclear weapon. <laughs> well, uh, actually, I only remember with all this planning I was doing, and I'd been in the Marines, which had scarcely any nuclear weapons and gave them up uh, eventually totally were nuclear free. So, uh, so uh, in fact, I, take, I would like to take some comfort from the fact that it's extraordinary, it's unique, that the Secretary of Defense is a Marine, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs is Marine, which is almost uh, unprecedented, I think. And the Chief of Staff, Kelly, is Marine. And I was just saying to Patricia, you know, these guys, they never had, they never had anything to do with nuclear planning. Uh, you know, and they never relied on nuclear weapons. Maybe there are people who could really change this. And I would say, by the way, that's not 100% impossible. That is a possibility. I would rather... I have a little more trust in them than, let's say, H.R. McMaster, who was Army and so forth, but than I would in an Air Force person, generally. Do I rely on them to stop this president if he decides that the time has come to carry out a threat, to pull the trigger? No, I actually don't at, at all. And a last, a last, uh, no, you asked me about touching the weapon. Yes. So one time I saw the weapon in Kunsan. Uh, no, not Kunsan, it was uh, Kadena in Okinawa. <coughs> and there were F-100s, each with a 1.1 megaton weapon slung under it. This is a one-person plane. And each of these 10 or so planes on the alert strip, uh, one fighter bombers, uh, they, they weren't even included in the SAC planning. SAC had such contempt for these fighter bombers that the they wouldn't be part of the 600 million calculation. These were just theater weapons that were out there. 1.1 megatons is half a World Testing War II two. worth of explosive yield. In World War II, we dropped 2 million tons of high explosive in all theaters. 2 megatons, 2 million tons. Each of these planes had 1.1 megatons under them. There were 10 or 12 of them on alert strip. So there was one there on a, on a dolly going by. Here was this magic thing, uh, nuclear weapon, not too large, about the size of the torpedoes we've seen from World War II. <coughs> and, um, you know, under a single fighter plane. And I put my hand on it. And it's warm. It's like an animal warmth from the plutonium, from the radioactivity. This was a cold day cool day. So here this cool day is just this warm weapon. But it's not really alive. It's not part of this biomass that I'm talking about. It really is something else. And what it has been designed to do by Americans, by one American university, has designed all of our nuclear weapons. From the uh, Hiroshima and the Nagasaki weapons, to the neutron <coughs> bomb, to the new weapons that are now being designed. Now there's a little more. One university, the University of California, has two campuses, Los Alamos and Livermore, that are called campuses of the... And, and Los Alamos, of course, is in uh, Nevada. Isn't it? Where is it? Nevada, yeah. Mexico. And it has extraterritoriality. You can vote in California elections. Uh, without an absentee ballot in Los Alamos, because it's part of the University of California. Okay, I just mentioned this. Sort of thing. <laughs> so it's been designed, it's been deployed, it was sent around by Americans, and now, of course, there's nine states that have this kind of thing. Only, however, three of those don't yet have H-bombs. They're only at the Hiroshima and Nagasaki level, which 
and the H bombs of the other of the other six require a Nagasaki type bomb a for a trigger, for a detonator. And the early H bombs were a thousand times more powerful, fifteen megatons instead of fifteen thousand. Right. So anyway, here is this non-living thing that has been designed by Americans and now by others to participate in the annihilation of life. And we've known that for 30 years. It's been confirmed for 10 years. It's being increased now by a Republican over the plans of a Democrat. So we're in, we're in trouble. We're, the species is in big, bad trouble. Okay. So we're going to have questions. Uh, but you know, at the end of the book, and I, I really urge everyone here to read it. it it's uh, part of his remarkable story. But you know, he's really an eyewitness. He does say that you know that the, the one hope is really the room, the people. Can can the people really keep on this issue and raise the problem and and really understand what's going on? And there's a generation who really don't understand this. And I think the book really should be read. It's it's not ancient history. And uh, thank you, Dan. If, and let's we're gonna have some questions now from the audience. Anything you want to ask about? Uh, Please wait for the microphone, and we'll be alternating sides. Well, I would like to know whether you have ever considered uh -oh, no. where I would like to know whether you've ever considered the economic paradigm that supports all this activity. The, the question, and I think I heard it, was whether you've ever considered the economic paradigm, paradigm. that supports all of this activity. Yes. <laughs> well, of course, Russia is now a capitalist country, right? Didn't used to be uh, of a kind. They call it a kleptocracy, but you know, what is this country? So uh, it's okay. So Russia now, under Putin, who is also spending a trillion dollars over the next 30 years for his weapons, his design labs have the same motives are done. Profits. And maybe jobs, maybe votes. I don't know how much he counts on that. Certainly in this country, I don't think any of this would have happened on this scale if it weren't highly profitable to make this stuff. In fact, I think that the Cold War uh, delusion that I suffered from, and uh, delusion in the sense uh, not that the Soviets were not tyrannous at home, which they were, as a matter of fact, like Kim Jong-un. Tyrannous. In fact, it's a rather Stalinist country right now. But the delusion that they were bending all effort to take over the world like Hitler, Hitler with nuclear weapons, where did that get started? And I think it heavily got started as a subsidy to the aerospace industry from 1946 on and for the next 40 years. Basically, it was a marketing device. This is an approximation, obviously. There's 10 other dimensions to it. But this is a very big one, a marketing device for selling weapons to the United States government uh, on a cost plus basis, which is highly profitable, and to our allies, and to supplying them now. The same kind of thing that Trump is boasting of right now, that he is selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, which, as he said, means jobs, and it means votes, and it means profits in this country to be used in Yemen, which is a crime against humanity that is, uh, I find, I can almost not bear to think about, to, c to face it all. It's going on right now and creating conditions of famine that have led to the biggest cholera epidemic in history in Yemen. And we are supplying targeting, logistics, support to that. And as Trump boasts of it, jobs. Uh, he's, that's not a secret that uh, we're selling weapons to Saudi Arabia and uh, so forth. So that's where we are. We have a military industrial complex, in other words, and congressional and corporate and, you know, and academic and various other dimensions to that, as do other countries now, but ours is really big and, and old and strong. And uh, that is very hard to beat. But it's not quite impossible, uh, actually, as uh, uh, these institutions are so powerful and yet Look what happened to the Communist Party in Russia under Gorbachev or in apartheid in South Africa. South Africa is no
paradise of freedom now by any means. But no one foresaw that Nelson Mandela would become president by a majority vote without a violent revolution. So miracles are possible with humans participating, and that's what we need to have. We should stop right now. No. <laughs> miracles are possible. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Ellsberg, uh, can you tell us what is the shelf life of the weapons in our arsenal and uh, what is their half life? The, yeah, he, he wanted the, the question is what is the shelf life of the weapons in our arsenals and the half life? Yeah, well, the, as I say, every weapon needs a Nagasaki type weapon, which is a plutonium implosion weapon, but now they also use highly enriched uranium. Uh, for these detonators and uh, so forth also, uh, which the half-life of plutonium is, I think, 23,000 years. So after 23,000 years, only half of it is left. Of course, uh, you know, we're talking half of a 1.1 megaton weapon, so we're down to a quarter World War uh, II after uh, 23,000 years. Not good. Is it gentleman here? Oh, sir. I don't know how to ask this specifically, but I would really like to know your thoughts about North Korea and the current situation. Thank you. He would like to know your thoughts. The question was, the, uh, he didn't really know how to frame it, but he said, what are your thoughts about North Korea and the current situation? Yeah. Uh, as far as I'm aware, which is certainly no expert, but I've, we've all had to you know, learn a lot in the last months uh, about this uh, and year and so forth. I can't, uh, first of all, North Korea is a tyranny like uh, Stalinist Russia at its worst, uh, as a matter of fact. I can't figure out that North Korea is any kind of a threat to us or anybody else unless attacked or unless they think they're about to be attacked, which could be a mistake, except that we're certainly doing, Trump is doing just about everything that can be imagined to promote that mistake that he's about to be attacked. We do exercises rehearsing invasion of North Korea. We publicly talk about assassination of their leader and decapitation, like Moscow, of their leadership in general. Uh, and uh, uh, we're uh, exercising. In fact, we have just sent uh, B-1, B-2, and B-52, still bombers, to Guam. We've reinforced them. Uh, that looks, uh, you would not have to be clinically paranoid as Kim Jong-un, and I, I don't think he is, by the way, uh, from all I've heard, to think I'm about to be attacked, and that's very dangerous. It doesn't threaten nuclear winter because 20 to 60 fission bombs, which is all North Korea has, much less than any other of the eight countries, nuclear weapons, they can't create nuclear winter. And I don't think there's enough, uh, this is macabre stuff I'm telling you here, I'm perfectly aware, I'm not, I'm not feeling lighthearted about it. But I'm saying it is simply a fact there aren't enough cities in North Korea to burn to the ground. We did that once. And by the way, we didn't create firestorms in 1950. We burned every city in North Korea totally to the ground. But unlike March 9th and 10th, Japan in Tokyo, we didn't create a firestorm. 1945. It's a, a special kind of fire, I'll just say, which lost the smoke into the stratosphere. So the fires we created in North Korea in 1950 didn't go into the stratosphere, and they didn't change the climate. A different, nor did they have nuclear weapons with which to retaliate. This president, people say, is there anything different about him? Well, to make threats of nuclear weapons is actually not new. Every president has considered making those threats. No president, from Harry Truman on, and no Kennedy, no major Kennedy, and I'm not including my friend Kucinich, let's say the 1%, or for that matter, Ron Paul at 1%. Uh, but every major, no major Kennedy has been willing to come close to announcing no first use. We will not initiate nuclear war. People were very struck that Trump wouldn't say that. 
Well, Hillary wouldn't say that any more than Trump would, and uh, nor Obama. Obama actually considered it. He seems to be the one president who, who actually spent several years telling people, why don't we have a no first use policy? I don't know uh, another president who did that. But he was overruled by his Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, said, no, we, we can't do that. And uh, so he gave it up. Um, in short, this is the first president since the Cuban Missile Crisis, 55 years ago, who is making threats of imminent attack against a nuclear weapons state. There are nine of those. We haven't made threats of attack. Nobody has against any of those states. Uh, India and Pakistan have, actually, against each other, and they managed not yet to pull the trigger. Uh, a last thought. I know I'm going on here, but I'll, I'll just add this. What a North Korean war might mean. It will not initially have this effect of nuclear winter, for the reasons I just described. But it will have a lot of other effects. Aside from killing, pardon me, but this is the reality, killing several million people in the first week or so, more violence than the human species has ever seen in a week or a day. So it will mean that. That's what he's threatening. But that's only a few million. However, it will almost certainly, I haven't seen anyone say this, it will mean, first it will mean nuclear war, almost certainly. Uh, Two-sided nuclear war. That will mean, since those amount to tests, and there's been a moratorium on tests since the 90s, it will mean the testing will restart, which the Republicans have been calling for for 20 years, you know, to restart nuclear testing. That means that India and Pakistan will get thermonuclear weapons within a couple of years. The difference, most people, you know, even in this very informed audience, I know from experience, most of you would not be able to tell me, I believe, the difference between an A and an H bomb, an atomic weapon, a fission weapon, and a thermonuclear weapon, until I've just described it. And I'm not going through that quiz now. But I am saying that the difference is that the India and Pakistan get thermonuclear weapons, then, whereas in India-Pakistan war, which has threatened to break out several times, and by the way, I just read two days ago, they are making explicit threats against each other like Trump's. This week, I didn't see that in any mainstream paper. I happened to see a reference to it in an Indian paper, and I followed up the link on the internet, and I discovered that uh, over Kashmir, they're both saying, in effect, my button is as big as yours. I am as ready to initiate nuclear war as you are. Indian and Pakistanis are saying that this week, and I don't think that is un coincidental in terms of what's going on with Kim Jong-un. And, uh, and our president. But anyway, if they went to war now, Alan Roebuck and, Roebuck and Brian Toon, uh, environmental scientists, calculated 10 years ago in 2007 in a peer-reviewed scientific article that the effect on the climate of their war with little fission bombs, only 50 each, and they each have more than that now, would produce, would reduce sunlight by about 7% instead of 70%. And that would shorten growing seasons, kill harvests, enough to starve, the first estimate was, about 900 million people who are currently the most malnourished. But a year later, Ira Halpern, the head of uh, International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, made new calculations closer to 2 billion. Well, that's one-third of the Earth's population. After the North Korean War, which could be next week, next month, later this year, it will be after the Olympics, almost surely, that's good. <laughs> but uh, later this year, from our president, it would mean that then their thermonuclear weapons, if they got together, would not kill a third of the Earth's population. It would be like ours, three-thirds, almost three-thirds. So there's really a lot at stake here, and we've got to stop this guy. But he didn't start these threats. He didn't build this system to begin with. It means we have to change our entire foreign policy, essentially, and our defense policy. We have to change how do you do this. But the political structure of the lobbyists and the retired officers and Boeing, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon 
are now bidding, as they did under Obama, for a whole new set of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which should not exist. We should have gotten rid of them just by Cold War standards 50 years ago right. and 40 question. years ago. Okay. Are, there any, are there any other questions? Sir, sir. Hi, I just wondered if you would have a word of warning or caution or advice for Mr. Snowden, who still is apparently sitting on quite a bit of information he hasn't released from your own experience. <coughs> well, he put out, uh, you know, it wasn't in my experience, so with his clearances at NSA, he put out an enormous amount of data, which I couldn't have done, by the way, in the pre-digital era. I did what I could with Xerox, which is 7,000 pages. I couldn't have done it without Xerox. But uh, he put out thousands of documents. And he put out a lot of stuff that he said that he, in his own opinion, he would not put it out to the public. He gave it to a handful of selected journalists, and he said, this is for your background to help you understand the context of this stuff and what the system is, but it's not necessary for the public to know it. I just want you to understand it. And he left it to their judgment. I th as far as I know, uh, Intercept, which has, is one of the places that has control of what he gave, uh, the digital magazine, The Intercept, uh, with Glenn Greenwald and, and uh, Jeremy Scahill and others, uh, has put on only a very small percentage, I, I would guess less than 10% of what they got. And uh, so there's uh, quite a bit still to come. They still, you know, as they go over all this stuff, they still come up with stuff all the time. But there was a lot that he thought uh, that he didn't give anybody that he knew in his head from his work in NSA. He was, people think that he just dumped out everything he knew. Uh, quite the contrary. He knew then and knows now a lot that uh, he didn't feel was in the public interest or necessity to put out. Any every listening post in China agents. We just we just uh, noticed two days ago was it uh, arrested a spy from CIA was it who had uh, led to the knowledge of a lot of our agents in China. Well, Ed has told me he knew all that stuff. He is not the source of that. He didn't feel that was necessary, and uh, so uh, the same was true of Chelsea Manning, by the way who had access to all his communications intelligence, covert intelligence. She put out nothing. And I have one last point here to me. She put out nothing uh, that was higher than secret. Well, secret, feeling that it couldn't be very damaging to the national security. I didn't have time to read anything as low as secret uh, when I was in the Pentagon. Literally, I tried to for a couple of days, and it was so overwhelming. I said, nothing but top secret limited distribution, executive distribution. So I didn't even read the stuff she put out. And I must say, when I read what she put out, I thought, geez, maybe I missed some stuff here. Because <laughs> uh, I don't think in my day assassination squads were handled at the secret level. <laughs> maybe they were. I don't think so. Uh, but now, you know, it's so routine under all our presidents that, uh, you know, it's just spread all over the place. But I'll add one other thing here. Bloomsbury was very concerned. Their lawyers were very concerned. Am I putting out anything classified in this thing that's going to give them trouble? Now, Obama, I was the first to be prosecuted for disclosing, leaking to unauthorized persons, the press, the public, classified information. The first in our hand. I wasn't the first leaker. I was the first to be prosecuted under Nixon. Two more were prosecuted before Obama. Obama prosecuted nine people for that, and three times as many as all previous presidents put together. Trump is almost certain not only to surpass that, he keeps berating Sessions for not indicting more people, and Sessions came back defensively and said, well, we have 27 under, under uh, investigation. So if they prosecuted them all, that would be three times Obama. But what he's really expected to do, or Trump, is to go beyond Obama. And what Nixon tried, wanted to do at the time of my case, Nixon intended to prosecute Neil Sheehan, Hedrick Smith, Noam Chomsky, um, Richard Falk, Howard Zinn, people that I'd given 
uh, parts of the Pentagon Papers too, but including the journalists. He was going to prosecute the journalists, but the way my trial ended in with crimes revealed that had brought down, that did bring down Nixon then eventually, including warrantless wiretaps. And uh, when Noam Chomsky asked, do you mind telling us when I've been overheard, you know, on warrantless wiretaps, uh, he and Zinn were dropped from further hearings before the grand jury. But they were going to be indicted. Now Trump is almost sure to indict journalists. So I told Bloomsbury was not too anxious and, you know, to wave a red flag in front of him. So I took some care. A lot of stuff has been declassified has been declassified since. In fact, I could even say most of what I knew at that time, not all of it, but most, not my notes and this and that, but, but the various nature of the plans and so forth has mostly been declassified in the succeeding 40 years. But not all of it. And it just occurred to me today, amazingly enough, I was being interviewed, and it occurred to me, we go back now to the beginning of this talk, So far as I know, this diagram, with its 325 million to be killed by our first strike in the USSR and China alone, and then my statement later that 300 million more people, I didn't mention the 100 million in neutrals like Austria or Finland that were next to the Soviet Union, a total of 600 million. That's never been declassified, actually. Bloomsbury got a little excited about that. In the end, they said about this chart. And so I finally told them what I had not been anxious to tell them earlier. I published that chart in Robert Shear's uh, digital column several years ago. So they can't get you for that. <laughs> but, but they could get me for that. It just occurred to me today. If Jeffrey Sessions, yeah, if Jeffrey Sessions wants to indict me for this revelation, I believe there has not in 70 years of the nuclear era been an official statement released, declassified or formally classified or whatever, of the actual casualties caused by any of our options. Never. In fact, to my best knowledge, Congress has never been told that. Robert Kerry, not my favorite guy for other reasons, not John Kerry, but Robert Kerry, Medal of Honor winner, several times presidential candidate, member of the Armed Services Committee, and the House uh, Homeland Security Committee, asked for what I've been telling you about the targeting of our SIA, our, our strategic plans. No need to know in the Senate. So he got his chairman to ask of the committee. No. As far as I know, Chairman, no Congress has never been told what I'm telling here, right here. And as I say, Bloomsbury isn't in trouble because I put it out before. The Pentagon Papers were finally declassified in 2011, 40 years after I released them. 2011, they, they did it on the day, you know, it was an anniversary. And uh, on June 13th, they're declassified. A year before that, Obama could have prosecuted me the same way he prosecuted nine other people for putting out the Pentagon Papers if I, if I distribute it again. Okay, I'm saying right now, my wife is not really excited to hear this, I see this. <laughs> but it is a fact, I would have to say, on the basis of Obama's criteria and certainly Jeff Sessions, I could be prosecuted for that and I would be convicted. Now, we'll see if he wants to do it and at 86 now, I'm ready to see that one go up to the Supreme Court and give them a little chance to have a whack at, <laughs> at that question. They have never addressed it. And I would say, should I go to prison? Remember, it's not a secret now. I put it in the book. Should I go to prison for putting out something that is classified, as far as I know? Top secret, right now, what I told you. By the way, if you tell anybody else what I've told you, and I've told you it's classified, <laughs> you could be prosecuted uh, on the same way. Thanks, everybody. Keep it to yourselves if you don't want that to happen. Thank you.
Much thanks to Daniel Ellsberg and Robert Rosenthal. And now we will sell books with City Lights Bookstore with yeah. Peter and Cassie. So please come up, have your book signed, and thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute. Anyway. <clears throat>